right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I thank you for another wonderful day that you've given us. Thank you for your blessings which surround us. And I pray, Lord, as I open my mouth wide, that you will fill it and that you lead me what to say and what not to say. And Lord, I thank you that you will have the people who need to hear this listen to it, Lord, and that it will take root in their heart and that will follow through with the wisdom that you've given us in your word. And I thank you, Lord, for equipping us to overcome the enemy and to be victorious in our lives, Lord, and become more like you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What's in your mind right now? What are you currently thinking and imagining? And what I really want to ask you is, do those thoughts, do those imaginations line up with what God says? Today, we have an epidemic of unrenewed minds, and there are minds that are full of ungodly thoughts, wicked imaginations, and God calls them degenerate, reprobate minds. Romans 1 verse 28 says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And Isaiah 55 verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So you can see here that thoughts are important to God, and that the unrighteous man has many thoughts that don't line up with God's character and nature. And it's understandable that the people of this world have degenerate reprobate minds, that their minds are full of trash and ungodly thoughts and images, that they're full of worry, lust, covetousness, greed, fear, and lies and bitterness. But these kind of thoughts, these kind of emotions, they should not be in the minds of the sons and daughters of Christ. First, Second Corinthians actually teaches us what we should do with those thoughts that try to rise up in our minds that don't belong there. 10 verses 4 to 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are not to let those thoughts run wild and do whatever they want to in our mind. Instead, we are to bring them into captivity like a flock of wild horses, a herd of wild horses, and you bring them into captivity, into corral. That is what we're supposed to do with these thoughts. And we have to cast down any of the imaginations that don't please God, that don't line up with his word and his character and his nature. But what kind of imaginations are those? They are any kind of imagination that does not agree with God's character and nature and that do not please Him. So there should be no perverted imaginings, negative imaginings, ungodly acts and deeds going on in our head or imagining other people doing them in our head. So we should not be picturing confronting somebody or getting revenge and nor should you imagine something bad happening. I remember there was a time my parents were late getting home and well, without even Thinking about it, all of a sudden I started imagining that something bad had happened to them. And God brought back this verse to my spirit about casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And the thing is, is that I realized that it wasn't just perverted imaginings, it was a negative imaginings, the ones the devil's constantly trying to fill us with because those imaginings give us fear and worry and anxiety and dread, and that's the opposite of God's character and nature. He wants us to have peace unspeakable and full of glory. And he wants these thoughts in our minds to be, according to Philippians 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And so automatically you can know if you're thinking about gossiping about somebody or how they've done you wrong or, or, how, or judging people because they're not dressed in the right clothes you think or doing what you should think. Those are judgmental thoughts, and they're not pure and lovely and full of praise. And so we can tell right away that we should not be thinking on those things, and we need to take them to captivity and get rid of them. Now, there is another imagining that I already mentioned that you really need to make sure that is not going on in your mind. 
God does not approve of it. And that is perverted imaginings. If you're imagining ungodly things or picturing ungodly images, then you will be held accountable for those thoughts. Just because you didn't physically do them does not mean that God doesn't say that you aren't guilty. Matthew 5 verses 27 to 29 addresses this. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body body should be cast into hell. And so let's say you struggle with that. You struggle with looking at things you shouldn't look and it's through the internet in your home. Well, you'd be better off getting rid of that internet than letting that internet open the door for the devil, which would lead you to damnation and destruction and an eternity in hell. So right now we see we need to guard our eyes. You can't take care of your thoughts if you're constantly letting perverted and dark things in through your ear gates and your eye gates. <laughs> you can, that's like throwing weed seeds into your garden and then not understanding why you have lots of weeds popping up in your garden. You're putting them in there and you're going to get them back. So we need to turn our eyes and our ears away from wrong images and, and filthy music and things that inspire lust and fear. Don't be watching movies, TV shows, games, or reading novels that have perversion, that have murdering, that are horror shows, that have cussing, parting, and actions that are the opposite of God's character and nature. David said, and he was considered a man after God's own heart, who greatly pleased God. He said in Psalm 101 verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. As I said, you cannot keep your thoughts clean if you are deliberately putting things before your eyes that are wicked. And if we call ourselves children of God, then we should not be partaking of the world's entertainment, of their sins, and the ungodly entertainment and things that they call good when they're not good. I remember 10 years ago, my family, we would sit down and watch certain Bollywood films. And they were clean family entertainment, though they still took our focus away from Jesus. So they were not the best thing to be watching anyway. If your entertainment is not inspiring a deeper passion and love for God and helping you to know him, then you might want to ask yourself, does God really want me watching this? But we were watching this movie and all of a sudden, the main romantic couple got involved physically before marriage on screen. We got up immediately, we turned that movie off, and we have never watched another Bollywood film again. And then several years ago, my parents and I were sitting down to watch a Hallmark romance film. We would watch them once in a while because, well, they're clean and free of perversion, but the thing is, is that in that couple, that movie had a same gender couple who were raising kids. You know what? From that day on, we stopped watching Hallmark movies. So how many of us are still watching things in spite of certain levels of perversion, even if it seems a little bit, where it shows stealing or where it shows the kids rebelling against the parents and it shows disrespect and it shows parting and it shows uh, bullying in schools and, and woke ideology. And how many of us have actually, because we've been watching this from little children up, we have become desensitized to sin and perversion, like a frog being slowly boiled in this water as it heats up bit by bit. And we can't, we don't see how perverted it is because we're being boiled to death, that heat is turning up. And we think, oh, that's not too bad. I mean, it could be worse. At least they didn't show anything. But the truth is, is that the majority of entertainment is still wicked. And if we were to compare it to God's pure standards and not the world's or our own personal standards, we would find that it does not please God and that it is wicked in his eyes. I remember watching one movie years and years ago and it was supposedly clean. It didn't show anything. And I got off and I thought, well, Lord, it, you know, that wasn't too bad. And he's like, really? And then he brought back to my mind, there was adultery in that movie. They didn't show anything. They just mentioned it. And yet I was desensitized and God woke me up saying, that is not clean and that's not appropriate. But I've watched and heard many Christians, they will promote books and TV shows and say, oh, I love this show. I love this book. And I thought, oh, really? You love that? 
From what I've read or heard, there's all kinds of inappropriate stuff in that. But we're like frogs in that water. It gets hotter and hotter and hotter and we get desensitized and we think, oh, it's not that bad. But it's not pleasing to God. And don't be deceived when you're putting it in your heart and your mind, you're going to reap the repercussions of doing that. And the Bible says to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. First John 2, verses 15 to 17. So we need to crucify our flesh with the affections and the lust thereof. We need to carefully guard our hearts. And in no way should we be supporting or giving our time and money to those who promote and push sexual perversion and violence and all kinds of ungodly lies that don't line up with the word and its truth. We should not trick ourselves and say, those things won't affect me. I can watch them. I can listen to that secular music. It's not making any difference in my life. I can then go read my Bible and, and live my life and it won't change me. But the Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 7 to 8, be not deceived. Don't trick yourselves. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. It's not maybe he'll reap it. You will reap it. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So if you sow negative news and inappropriate images, ungodly music and violent games into your heart and your eyes, you will reap corruption. It will affect you. In The Sound of Freedom, a movie about child trafficking, they explain how people become so evil. And it touched my heart because it made me realize how much in danger we all are, how the devil gets in there, because it all starts with just looking at inappropriate images and videos. And that can be the modern day movies, maybe even Star Trek or something where they show having a relationship on screen. It just starts with wrong images and videos, but your flesh, it's not satisfied. And so it will search out even worse images and more explicit material. And then that's not enough to satisfy you, so it leads to material with minors. But still, the flesh is not satisfied. And I know this is an uncomfortable subject, but I want you to realize how devious and horrible Satan is. Because once all these things happen, they sow this to their flesh. It drives these people to commit heinous crimes. And you sit back and think, oh, I would never do that. But meanwhile, you're opening the door to the devil. Be not deceived. You keep on sowing to the flesh, it will grow because it's a monster and it cannot be satisfied. That is how the devil works. He wants you to open the door. He wants you just to, a little crack. Oh, an advertisement showing inappropriate images popped up on your screen. Well, if I just click on it, it won't hurt anything. But yes, it will. That open door is all he needs. Slowly and surely, he will pry it open until he has fully come into your home and he has destroyed you. So no matter what you do, don't open the door to the devil. It's just a little lie. It doesn't matter. It won't hurt a thing. It's just a little deed. No one will notice if you take something. It's just a little bite. A tasty fruit dripping with pleasure. I promise you won't die. God only wants to keep you smothered. But I, I will give you your desires. Hear the devil whisper on the other side Waiting for you to open wide But don't open the door to the devil Don't invite him in, giving in to saying Don't open the door to the devil For there are consequences And there are repercussions Knock, knock knock hear the devil knock no matter what he says don't open the door 
go around and sleep with him. Why do you need to wait for marriage? Oh, God will understand. He knows today that's just the way it is. Go on and take a peek. It doesn't count as soon as just a near image. Don't worry, God won't see. Your deeds are hidden in the darkness. Don't be afraid, there are no consequences. Hear the devil whisper on the other side, waiting for you to open wide. But don't open the door to the devil. Don't invite him in, giving in to sin. Don't open the door to the devil, for there are consequences, and there are repercussions. Knock, 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 hear the devil knock, no matter what he says. Don't open the door, don't open the door, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't open the door, he's a lion looking for a new prey, he'll use any ploy. But don't open that door, and if you've let him in, kick him right out, repent and turn your life about. And don't let him back in. Don't open the door to the devil. Don't invite him in, giving in to sin. Don't open the door to the devil, for there are consequences and there are repercussions. Knock, 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 hear the devil knock, no matter what he says. Knock, 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 hear the devil knock, no matter the temptations. Don't open the door. No matter what the temptation, don't open the door. We are not being warned enough about the repercussions of sins, of giving into our flesh and opening the door to the enemy. We are being blinded to the battleground that is going on in our mind. Because if Satan can whisper a thought into our heads and get us to take it as our own, to accept it, to start marinating it, he can start bringing us into bondage, the bondage of greed. Oh, you need that for happiness. Or, you know, you should do this. It'll help you feel better if you just go and snack in the kitchen at night. and. Little things that seem innocent to us, but he brings us into bondage with these things. And he leads us into lust and anxiety and worry and fear by these thoughts and even emotions that he will plant. And if we really succumb to his temptations, then we'll start doing things we should not do. And those things can bring destruction. First Peter 5 verse 8 to 9 warns us about Satan. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist standing steadfast in the faith. We are to resist the devil, not give in to his temptations. He's not our buddy. He's trying to damn your soul for eternity and destroy you and use you to destroy the people around you. If he can get you to feel bitter, you'll go around and you'll spread malicious gossip and then you'll destroy other people because they'll start feeling bitter. So if we don't take his ungodly thoughts and cast those thoughts down, then we will be held accountable if we embrace them and start thinking about them because God destroyed those people before the flood. And this is one thing he says about them in Genesis 6 verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so we are to make sure that our thoughts are not full of evil. Remember, God will hold us accountable for those thoughts. And we want to make sure that we're not running, letting all of our thoughts run amok. You think, well, I'm not thinking evil thoughts, but you're thinking about this and that and that and this, and you're not focused and you're losing your peace, you're losing your joy. And you know what? It could even be that you're losing the ability to hear God's voice, His Holy Spirit directing you because it's much too loud and much too busy in your mind. So 
if you have this unrenewed mind and it's just running here and there and you're embracing the thoughts of the devil, what do we do about it? How do we handle that? Because it's a battleground in there and we have to have the right weapons or we will fail. Well, Joshua 1, 8 says, The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Psalms 1, 1 to 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his love, law doth he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper psalm 63 verse 5 to 6 my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when i remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches i will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doing I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. Meditate upon these things. 1 Timothy 4 verse 15. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. So there you go. In our mind, we are to deliberately meditate on the Word of God, on what He has done in the past, and what He has done in our lives and other people's lives, on the good things that He's done, on Jesus Christ our Savior. And if we do that, promised to us by the Word of God, if we constantly give our minds to His Word, we will be like trees planted by the river of water. There may be other trees around us and they'll be shriveling up and dying and full of worry and stress and fear and disease and, and confusion. But we, because we're meditating on God's word, will have abundant life. Our leaves will be green even in the time of drought, another verse says. We will bring forth fruit, love and joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. And what, whatever we do, will prosper. I don't know about you, but I certainly love the idea that whatever I do will prosper and it will be good. But in order to have that, in order to thrive like that tree planted by the rivers of water, we have to meditate on God's word day and night. You say, well, how can I meditate it on it at night? Well, for example, at night, instead of letting my thoughts run amok and think about this and that and what I was saying earlier, what someone else said earlier, what I had watched earlier, what someone else said 10 years ago, or what I have to get done in my long list and just running around like a crazy child who's just eaten too much sugar, I will turn on my scripture songs and I will force my mind to listen when it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And there have been times where even fear has tried to hit me or an anxiety, and I will rebuke it in Jesus' name, and I will force my mind to meditate, to listen to those scripture songs. And there's even YouTube videos that are three, six hours plus where they they speak and they read the word of God and they have the sound of rain falling in the background. So if you're struggling with wrestling your thoughts at night and you can't go to sleep, try listening to these videos full of the word of God. Because this word, when you're meditating on it, you're planting it in your mind. And it is a powerful weapon against the devices of the enemy. That is our sword on the battleground of our mind. For the word of God is quick and powerful, Hebrews 4, verse 12, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and it is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God is our weapon. As we know, taking up the shield of faith, wherewith be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and put on a helmet of salvation and take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. If you're on the battleground and the devil is bolstering you and smacking you with his arrows and everything else and you're just standing there and, and you're getting 
torn to pieces and you don't know what's wrong, well, you need to take up your shield of faith. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It all comes right back to the word of God. So if you are taking your times to listen to multiple podcasts throughout the day and you're watching this program and that program, stop that. That's not how you're going to get victory. That's not how you're going to grow your faith in Jesus Christ. Put on the word of God. Put on the scripture songs. Put on worship music that really exemplify and talk about God's character and nature and having victory in him. And those words, that word of God planted in our hearts and minds will enable us to fight, to fight against the enemy, to overcome his thoughts, to overcome his emotions. I remember there was a time I was in the kitchen and I'd gotten into an argument with one of my family members. And man, did I want to think thoughts like, they're ridiculous. It's their fault. If they would just do this, they're being unreasonable and so on and so forth. But instead of letting those thoughts nest in my mind and come home to stay, I deliberately pushed them out and I meditated on the word of God. I took 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7 and I thought, love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So as I kept on thinking on these scriptures and just making sure that I stayed laser focused on them, it did not stop the immediate emotions of being angry, frustrated, and upset, but it did stop those devilish thoughts from coming in and fanning extra flames of anger, extra hurt and hatred and bitterness to where you can't even let it go and you just want to smack them. But sadly, many of us Christians, we don't know how to handle all these little negative thoughts henpecking our brain and coming in like an army of enemy soldiers. And we just let them come in and we don't know how to handle them. And we think on them then. We meditate on these thoughts. We let these emotions stew in us and grow into a, a cauldron of boiling, rotting putrefaction and we don't know why our lives are destroying and we get more angry more frustrated and bitter and this is what happened to Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were the first sons of Adam and Eve and they were brothers. Genesis 4 verses 2 to 8 talks about how Abel kept the flocks of sheep and goats and this is the amplified but Cain cultivated the ground he grew the vegetables and the fruits and in the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground but Abel brought Brought the offering of the finest firstborn of his flock and the fat portions. And the Lord had respect. He had regard for Abel and his offerings. But for Cain and his offering, he had no respect. So Cain became extremely angry, indignant, and he looked annoyed and hostile. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? And why do you look so annoyed? If you do well, believing me and doing what is acceptable and pleasing to me, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, but ignore my instruction, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you to overpower you, but you must master it. Cain then talked with Abel's brother, and when they were alone working in the field, Cain attacked Abel's brother and killed him. Cain, he did not get mastery over those thoughts. It says, sin crouched at his door. And you know what? He festered in those dark thoughts and emotions. He let that sin in his door. And undoubtedly, the devil fed him a string of negative thoughts full of bitterness and enviousness, enviousness and jealousy and anger. And when that sin came in, when he opened it, he embraced it, and the end fruit was murdering his brother. As I've said several times, we need to be so careful about what thoughts that we let running through our heads because most of our thoughts are either devilish or godly. They either line up with God's character and nature or they line up with the devil's character and nature. Picture a scenario where you have a bill that has to be paid and you're financially hard off and you have these thoughts that totally sound like they're coming from yourself. I won't be able to make this payment. 
I, I'll be kicked out on the streets. What am I supposed to do? There's nothing I can do. Why doesn't God care? Why doesn't he make a way out for me? Ding, ding, ding. These are the thoughts from the enemy of your soul. Satan, they are full of despair, anxiety, doubt, hopelessness. They're accusing God. But the scripture says if we were to go back to the word of God, which is our sword, which enables us to fight against the enemy, he says in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5.7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Isaiah 65, verse 24, and it shall come to pass that before before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. And another verse that says, If God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So when you hear these thoughts, these negative emotions, let me tell you, this is how you should handle it. First of all, the Bible says in Matthew 7, verse 7 to 8, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Then Philippians 4, verse 6, gives us more instructions. Be careful, be worried, anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So, first of all, in this battle in your mind, take the instructions from the Bible and say, Lord, I ask that you cover this bill, that you provide the finances that I need, that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. And then, right after you've made prayer and supplication, it says, thank God with your mouth. Say, oh, thank you, Lord. I thank you that you will provide for my needs. I thank you, Lord, you will come through. Then when those thoughts come around saying, oh, God doesn't care, and you won't be able to make this pill, bill paid, and you'll get kicked down into the streets, you rebuke Satan and say, I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name because you need to hear yourself. You believe your own voice more than anybody else's. And so when you hear these thoughts, don't just shake your head or say, mm, no, 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 I don't believe that, I don't believe that. No, say with your mouth, I don't believe that. My God shall supply my needs. He will take care of me. He will make a way in the wilderness. Rivers in the desert will I see. God not only cares for me, he died for me. He sent his only son to sacrifice his life for me, to save me from sin. And if he cared that much for me then, to give his everything, of course he's going to cover this little bill. He is going to provide all my needs. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. Speak life over your circumstances and worship God. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Ephesians 5 verses 18 to 20 says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in our mastery for our mind in this battle that's constantly raging, we need to meditate on God's word. We need to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Give thanks to him. So unlike the world's advice that says we should empty our mind and go into Zen mode, where we just clean out the whole chamber and think about absolutely nothing, the Bible tells us, uh -uh. We are to fill it with his spirit, his word, with praise and gratitude. So speak in tongues, sing in tongues, sing. My God shall supply all my needs. He will make a way away from me. I put my trust in him constantly. So instead of emptying your mind, like I said, sing the word, listen to the word, read it, meditate on it. Like I said again, the goal is not to empty your mind. You're not going to win your battle against Satan's enemy because he's not going to leave your mind alone. He is going to come on full force, and if he finds it empty, well, what do you think is going to happen then? We do not want to be like that man who the unclean spirit was cast out of in Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty. 
empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be with this wicked generation. So we should not be emptying our minds and trying to empty ourselves. Instead, we invite Jesus Christ in, who is the Word made flesh, and He fills us up. He dwells in us. He shines as a bright light, chasing away the darkness. And as we delve into His Word, we come to recognize His voice versus the enemy's. John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. God's voice, it will bring life, hope, joy, correction, but not condemnation, peace, not confusion, forgiveness, not bitterness, instruction, and all the fruits of the Spirit. It's not ugly, it's not nasty, it does not put you down, it does not give you hopelessness and despair. So we have to recognize the difference between God's voice and Satan's or we will end up embracing the thoughts that don't belong in our minds. <clears throat> Those devilish thoughts will be like the cuckoo birds who lay their eggs in someone else's nest. The cuckoo bird doesn't even try to raise its own young. It wants someone else to do it. In fact, they will do it secretively, laying that egg in someone other bird's nest. Because if that parent bird sees them, they'll push that egg right out. But the cuckoo bird will deliberately cause a disturbance and distract them so they can sneakily lay that egg into the nest. And if that bird can convince that other bird that that egg belongs to them, They'll then sit on it and sit on it and sit on it until it hatches. But get this, when that baby cuckoo hatches, it will push the other eggs and chicks, if they're there, out of the nest to their death. So it will receive all the attention of the parents. And then those parent birds, they'll wear themselves out as they feed that little imposter until it grows and grows two to three times larger than them. Finally, when it reaches maturity in 20 days, it will leave the nest, but those so-called parents will continue to feed it for the next few weeks. And that cuckoo bird is symbolic of the devil, and the devil will secretively try to put his eggs, his thoughts, into our minds. He'll use distractions. He'll use hardships. He'll use other people to distract us from the truth, and then he'll sneak in. Then if he can get us to embrace that thought that we had at our lowest point or when we were distracted, that emotion, then we'll sit on it thinking that it's true and it belongs in my mind and we'll meditate on it until it hatches. And then we'll feed it and it will kick out all of God's thoughts and all of God's directions and all of God's emotions because those get in the way of its agenda. And then it will take over and grow and grow. And then we become tired and as we struggle and we keep on feeding this thought and it consumes us and takes over us and we become slaves as it takes over the nest, as it takes over our heart and our minds. So beware of Satan's thoughts. Beware of those little eggs he tries to plant in your mind. I remember one time he tried to plant that thought, oh, you do so much for your family, and it'll be easier if you're alone because you won't have to take care of them so much. And I didn't embrace it, but I definitely heard that little voice there. And then God, through his word, over the next few days, I could see, wait a moment, my father does this, my mother does this, my brothers do this. I couldn't do this all on my own. I'm not special hot sauce who's doing everything, but it was just one little thought. And if I'd let that in and I sat on it and marinated on it, it would have brought destruction and division in my home because I could become bitter at them taking advantage of me because I'm the one who's doing everything and not them. See how insidious and sneaky the devil is? So we have to be careful. Don't fall for his deceptions. Throw those cuckoo eggs out of your nest or they will hatch and they'll wipe out God's peace. They'll wipe out his thoughts and they'll cause you to be tired, proudful, full of worry, faithless, doubting, full of fear, bitterness, shame, anxiety, lust, greed, pride, impatience, etc., etc. So guard your mind. 
guard your heart. You are in a battleground. You say, well, I get tired. It doesn't matter. God will strengthen you and renew you. Just because you don't want to fight doesn't mean the devil isn't there. So you've got to be equipped with the word of God. And by just meditating on the word of God, you can be renewed to soar on the wings like an eagle. They that the Bible says they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. So if you're tired and you hear this thought, oh, you're too tired to go on. Don't start saying with your mouth, oh, I'm too tired to go on. There you go. You just had a cuckoo egg legged into your, a cuckoo egg in your nest and you're just starting to take it. Now you're starting to marinate on it and sit on it and you don't want that thing hatching. So no, wait, say, no, Lord, I'm resting in you. You are my strength and I'll run and not grow weary. I'll walk and not faint. And don't listen to God, the, the devil's lies and his devices and his distractions. And they can even come through close family friends or family members. Hannah, a woman in the Bible, heard the voice of the enemy all the time. And initially, she took it to heart. And it would cause her tears and anger and frustration. And she heard them through Penina, Akana's second wife. So you see, Hannah was infertile and had no children. But Penina had several children. And every year, Alcana, Hannah, and Penina went up to Shiloh to offer sacrifices and other things before the Lord. And right here it says, her adversary would provoke Hannah sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so, year by year, Alcana would go up to the house of the Lord. Uh, Hannah finally went up to the house of the Lord. And it says, Penina provoked her. Therefore, Hannah wept and did not eat. So Penina tortured Hannah, just like the devil would torture us and say, God won't come through for you. He won't keep his promises. Oh, well, he's, he's forgotten you. He's going to abandon you. You're going to be old and all alone and torture after torture. And so Hannah who would weep and cry over this. And finally, she went to the temple. She called out to God and she said, you know, she called out to God and poured her soul out before him. And Eli said, after a conversation, go in peace and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat and her countenance was no more sad. She wasn't sad anymore because she embraced the word of God. She believed it. She took it to heart, the word of God. Undoubtedly, Panina continued to torture her and say, oh, your child and God's the one who shut up your room and you won't have any children and, and so on and so forth. But you know what? She didn't listen to Satan's lies coming through Panina and she no longer wept. She no longer doubted and feared and she no longer let those words steal her joy and peace. She could have listened. She could have let Satan steal God's promises from her. And instead, she chose to embrace the word of God, and God came through. We read how Hannah went on to have a little boy named Samuel. And afterwards, the Bible says the Lord visited Hannah. So she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. God did not forget Hannah, and he has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten his promise to you. He has not abandoned you. Don't be listening to the voices around you or the, the thoughts in your head that says he doesn't care. He's not there for you, that he, that you've, you've messed up one too many times and you can't repent anymore. No, repent. Call on to God and he will answer you. We need to be like Hannah. Instead of embracing the lies of Satan, be they through the whispers of family, friends, loved ones, social media all around us, or the careless comments of family members, we need to embrace what God says. Stop letting the devil torture you. Stop letting him cause you to cry in pain and fear and doubt and disbelief. Take what God has said in his word. Take his promises and tell those lies. Those emotions of Satan and everything he says, go. Oh, my days have been robbed and my life has been blue too many times. Vacillating between trusting in God and being tortured at night. Thinking that he won't do what he said he would do. Feeling depressed and anxious, sad and downcast. But he tells me to trust because he's faithful and true. So devil, this is what I say to you. 
I say go, go, go. Fear and anxiety, you have no place in me. So go, go, go. Take your depression, unbelief and doubt. All of your worries, I command you to get out and go. Go, go, there is no place for you, for your lies and half-truth. So I command you to go, 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 you gotta go, 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 in Jesus' name I command you to go. Now I'm standing my ground cause I've had enough of being your punch bag. So I'm taking my sword and I'm taking my shield. And I'm fighting back Yes, I'm serving notice on all of your emotions Your fear and bitterness, confusion and hatred And in God I will rejoice and trust that'll come through So devil, this is what I say to you I say go, go, go Fear and anxiety, you have no place in me So go, go, go home Take your depression, unbelief and doubt out. All of your worries, I command you to get out and go, go, go. There is no place for you for your lies and half truths. So I command you to go, go, go. You gotta go, 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 go. In Jesus' name, I command you to go. Get out right now. I'm not letting you play your games. Get out, cause I know those that wait on God won't be ashamed. Get out right now, don't you dare ever come back. For Jesus won the war, that's a matter of fact. And there's no more tears coming from these eyes over your lies. For I don't have a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So I command you to lose me and let me go. In Jesus' name, I said go, go. Go, fear and anxiety, you have no place in me to so go. Go, go, take your depression, evil thoughts and doubts. All of your worries, I command you to get out. I've had enough this time, you hear me shout out. Go, 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 there is no place for you, for your lies and half truths. So I command you to go, 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 you've got to go. Go, 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 in Jesus' name I command you to, in Jesus' name I command you to, in Jesus' name I command you to, go. So we need to fight back with the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God and take authority over our enemy and tell him, go in Jesus' name. But in order to do that, in order to fight the battle, we must hide the Word of God in our hearts. We must meditate on it day and night so that it may be well with us. Don't let the cuckoo bird lay its egg in your nest, sit on it and marinate it and let it grow two to three times larger into a monster where it devours you. Don't let your eye gates and ear gates wide open so that the enemy can just come parading in with him and his enemy forces. And don't let the enemy steal God's life and his blessings and his joy and his hope from you and your heart. Take those thoughts captive, kick those thoughts out and loudly declare in Jesus name that the word of God is true. Declare it over your heart, your mind, your body, your circumstances, your family and say, I know God, you're not a man that you should lie. Neither the son of man that you should repent. Have you said it? Shall you not do it? Have you spoken? Shall you not make it good? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I choose to stand upon the firm foundation of God's word and I will not be overcome. I have the victory in Jesus name. So let's stand and fight this battle and not empty your minds or lay down dead, but fight, fight with the word of God and gain victory. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this word that has gone forth. And I thank you, Lord, that you will start purposely helping them realize what thoughts have been in their minds or are coming into their minds that are devilish and not of you, Jesus. Thoughts that they always took just the 
they think they themselves have thought and that belong there and expose the enemy's devices, Lord. Set free the captive, cause the blind to see and to be led in the way of peace and life. And I thank you, Lord, for this word and that it will bring victory in people's hearts as they do it, as they hide your word in their heart that they might not sin against you. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.